1.3, describing quantitative data with numbers. We're going to start with some familiar things that you probably already know about. The most common measure of center is the plain old ordinary mean, or the average. And to find the mean, and this is actually the notation we use, x bar, right? It's a little x with a bar over it. That's lowercase. Um, to find the mean, we typically just add up everything there, are, everything there is, all the observations. So the sum of all the observations divided by however many observations there are. So that's n. So simple concept. You're used to finding the mean. You know how to do it. Uh, you may not be used to this notation, though. So another way you might see it expressed, and we can call this the expanded form. Let's say each one of these little x's is one of the observations. So this is the first observation, the second observation, and maybe these are grades, right? Uh, think about your grade and how we take the average of that. Here's your third observation, all the way up to the nth observation. So if that's the ninth observation, for example, we would divide by 9. Whatever n is, that's how many there are, so that's what we divide by. So some math notation that you might see elsewhere in statistics. You may or may not have seen it before, depending on your previous math class. This Greek letter here, it's actually sigma. It looks like a big E thing. So that's short for summation. And another way to say that is just add them all up, right? Add all the terms up. So when you see that big Greek letter sigma, that means add everything up. So I actually have one more way to express the formula for x bar, which is just plain old mean. And that is x bar equals the sum of everything on top, the sum and I, I typically like to tell kids, I think about this I as the individual. So the sum of all the individual x observations divided by n, divided however many there are. So the sum of all the individual x observations divided by however many there are. Now, are you going to need all these formulas? No, I think you guys are probably pretty good with what the mean is by now and how to calculate it. But you will actually see this on the AP Stats formula sheet. So anytime you see that big E thing, that's actually a Greek letter, sigma, and it means sum. Add everything together. The next part here it says another common measure of center is the median. The median is that blank. The median describes the midpoint of a distribution. So it's definitely different than the mean, although they're both measures of center. So a median is another way to measure center. Uh, it says the median is the midpoint of a distance. So the number that's half of the observations are smaller than it and the other half are larger than it. So there's our definition for median. It's truly the middle observation. To find the median, what would you have to do? Well, you'd have to look at all the observations from smallest to largest. So go ahead and arrange those observations from smallest to largest. And then the second thing, if you have an odd number of observations, then the median is literally just the middle number. It's the center observation. But what if you have an even number of observations? Well, then there's going to be two numbers in the middle, and you take the average of those two center observations. So we have two ways to measure center right now. We have the mean, where we take the average, and we have the median or we just find the middle observation. One of them is resistant to outliers, right? It's not really heavily influenced by outliers, whereas one actually is influenced by outliers. One is not resistant to outliers. So the median is actually the resistant one. It is resistant to extreme values, whereas the mean is not resistant to extreme values. This is why when people try to find a measure for center of a housing distribution, let's say, so the price of houses, they use the median. Because the average price of a house in an area might be thrown off by some of the really, really expensive ones. So that's just an example of the mean not being resistant to outliers. Whereas the median, you can have a few uh, outliers, right? You can have some of the really expensive houses, but the median truly only cares about the price of the middle house of the distribution. 
So let's take a look at example one. It says use the data below to calculate the mean and median of the commuting times in minutes of 20 randomly selected New York workers. And here's that data right here. So let's start with the median. And to do the median correctly, we should arrange these uh, in order from least to greatest. So if we can just go down the line here, it looks like we have a 5, a 10, a 10, 3, 15, 4, 15s. 20, 20, 20, 25, 30, 30, 40, 40, 45, 60, 60, 65, and then some poor person that has to drive 85 minutes to work. So now that we've got them in order, we can look directly in the middle to find the median. So if there's 20 total observations, we can count over either way, count over 10 observations from either side, and notice we're right here in the middle. So being in the middle, we've got 20 and a 25. Those are our two middle observations. So for our median, we have to find the number that's between those two. So 20 plus 25 divided by 2 should get us there. 20 plus 25 over 2. What number is smack dab between those two numbers? That would be 22.5 for our median. And don't forget that context piece. Let's go ahead and make sure it's 22.5 minutes. And then for the mean, that's the one we're used to, right? We just throw all 20 observations in our calculator. We're going to add all those up and divide by however many there are, which is 20. So for the mean, we'll call that x bar. We actually get 31.25 minutes. So in this case, why is the mean so much higher than the median? And it goes back to our, our conversation about things being resistant. The median is resistant to extreme values. The mean is not. So for example, the person that drove 85 minutes to work is really having a large influence on our mean whereas it, that person doesn't quite affect the median very much. So we talked about two ways to measure center, that being the mean or the median. Now let's talk about measuring spread, so how wide a distribution can be. And the one we're used to, the most common one, would just be the range. So that's just the maximum value minus the minimum value, the biggest minus the smallest. Uh, a measure of center alone, it says, can be misleading. So maybe that's the reason why. We don't talk about just center. We may also need to mention spread in the conversation as well. So how do you calculate the quartiles and interquartile range? This is going to be another measure of spread for us. Quartiles, you can think about the root word there being quarters, so 25%. And the interquartile range uh, is a comparison between two quartiles. And actually, we look for the first quartile, Q1, and the third quartile, Q3. Since we're used to percentiles by now, we can think of Q1, the first quartile, as being that lower 25th percentile. And the third quartile, Q3, well, that's the 75th percentile. Well, why don't we talk about Q2? Well, we already have a name for Q2. That would be the 50th percentile, which is exactly what the median itself is. So one useful measure of spread is the interquartile range. We look at the 75th percentile, or Q3, and we compare it to the 25th percentile, Q1. Interquartile range, IQR, is defined as just Q3 minus Q1. So the math behind that is actually really simple. IQR, interquartile range, you just do Q3 minus Q1. So the next example here says find and interpret the IQR for each McDonald's nutritional value and its fat measured in milligrams for each data set. Uh, so we have the beef sandwich data set and the fish sandwich data set. So if I can just scroll down here. Um, to be able to find the IQR or just Q3 or just Q1 or even the median, we need to go ahead and order these things. So from smallest to largest, uh, let's start with the beef sandwiches here. The smallest I think is a 9, then we have a 12, a 19, 23, 24, 26, 26, 
27, 29, 29, 31, and 43. So that's going to be important. Let's go ahead and order those so we can start uh, by finding the median. So the median, if we just cut that in half, our median would just be 26 grams because we have one, two, three, four, five, six observations on this side, one, two, three, four, five, six observations on this side. So in the middle we have two 26s here. So even if you add those up and divide by two, our median is still just 26 grams. Okay, so to find Q1, it's really the same exact process. We're looking for the middle of this lower half of the data. So if you can find the middle of the lower 50%, that would put you at the 25th percentile. So we only have six observations here. So the middle would fall right here between this 19 and 23. That's going to be our Q1, our first quartile. At the 25th percentile would be, well, what's between 19 and 23, right? You can add them up and divide by two. We have 21 grams for our Q1. And let's look at uh, the upper 50% here the same way. So what would Q3 be? Well, let's find the middle of these top six distribution, or these top six observations, excuse me. 29 and 29, well, you can add those up and divide by two. We still get 29 as our third quartile, or Q3. So what's our IQR then? If it's Q3 minus Q1, our bigger one, Q3, was 29. Smaller one was 21. So 8 represents the IQR in this case. Let's go ahead and give that a G for grams to add some context there. All right, and let's not forget about our fish sandwiches over here. Again, let's start by putting these things in order. So we have a 9, a 14, a 16, a 19, another 19, a 20, a 22, a 27, and a 33. So we've got them in order. And then let's start by just chopping this thing in half. Let's find the median first. Well, since we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 observations, that means if I count 4 on this side and 4 on this side, I'll have a number exactly in the middle. So the number exactly in the middle of those 9 observations would be 19. Notice I have 4 over here, 4 over here. So 19 would be my median. Okay, so we have to start with the median because then we can look at the lower half of the data and we can find Q1. So just cut in half the lower half of the data. So right here between 14 and 16, our Q1 would be 15. And then for Q3, look at the upper half of the data and cut it in half. That gives us our 75th percentile, or Q3, to be 24.5. How am I getting 24.5? Again, what number is smack dab between 22 and 27? You can add them up and divide by 2 if you like. You should be at 24.5. So then our IQR for the fish sandwiches. Well, Q3 minus Q1, so 24.5 minus 15, we should be at 9.5 grams for our IQR. And again, these are both measures of spread. 75th percentile minus the 25th percentile. Okay, so the next piece here has to do with identifying outliers. So I'm going to actually give you a specific formula that you can follow when you want to call something an outlier for sure. And that's an important point to make here. Um, you've got to actually calculate something before you can call it an outlier. So before you start calling observations outliers, um, you should actually have to prove that and say, well, I calculated it, and look, this value is indeed an outlier. So let's go ahead and make sure you calculate that before you actually call it an outlier. That's why sometimes you'll hear me say, uh, there looks like there could be a possible outlier somewhere. OK, so our rule. There's upper and lower outliers possible. It's called the 1.5 times IQR rule. And that pretty much covers it, 1.5 times the IQR. So what do we do with that? Uh, any values above Q1 
Q3 plus that 1.5 times IQR would be considered an outlier. So those could be the upper outliers, and then any values below Q1 minus 1.5, the IQR, those would be considered low outliers. So two places to look. This is where the large outliers would fall. This is where the smaller outliers would fall. So those will actually be really important throughout the rest of the year. How do you prove something's an outlier? Um, well, if it's above this, and I like to think about them as being an upper fence and a lower fence, right? If you hit the ball beyond the upper fence or below the, uh, the lower fence, that would actually be considered an outlier. So Q1 asks, were there any outliers in the New York commuters data set? So I'm going to leave the calculations to you on this one to check, do Q3 plus 1.5 the IQR, and then check the lower fence, Q1 minus 1.5 the IQR. And you should only identify one, and that being the, the one with an 85-minute commute. So on the surface, it definitely looked like the 85-minute commute was an outlier, but it's actually worth proving and showing the work uh, before we can actually call it for sure an outlier. OK, and then the last thing we have to talk about in these notes is the five number summary. And notice the nice stars on the outside of this one. So what's included in the five number summary? It says the min and max values alone tell us little about the distribution as a whole. Likewise, the median and quartiles tell us little about the tails of a distribution. To get a quick summary of both center and spread, we're going to combine all five numbers. So, what is the five num sum, a.k.a. the five number summary? Well, it starts with the min, the minimum, that's the smallest number. And then we've got Q1, or the 25th percentile. So that's the first quartile, Q1. And then we've got the median, right, smack dab in the middle of the median. And then we're at Q3, and then the maximum. That would be our five number summary. So, great way to describe a distribution. We're actually going to use the five number summary uh, in the next notes when we go to make box plots or box and whisker plots, if you will. But that is all for these notes, so I will see you in class.